and also discuss how the present crisis might be resolved and the prospects for developing a future more positive relationship between Iran and the West. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I, is it okay if I sit down? Because I'm not going to manage to do this. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm, I had to think of a date to start, because obviously I can't start in the 13th century or 12th century. And I think the 19th is a good time to start, the 19th century. Uh, at a time when Iran was known as Persia, um, not Iran. And I think that is the period where, uh, in the memory of even contemporary Iranians, the role of Britain and Russia and the colonial interests of Russia and Britain remains quite vivid in the way the country was divided, uh, occupied at the end of 19th century by Britain, the whole oil, um, uh, if you like, excavations, the discovery of oil in Iran, Darcy's contract with the, uh, with the Zen Gajar dynasty. Um, for Iranians, they still remember the fact, for example, that uh, BP was uh, known in the south of Iran as Benzina Pars, Persian Benzin or Persian oil because that's what the Brits told them, and they were fooled by this notion. Um, such stories and the whole history of that period were, in many ways, between them in the south of Iran, Great Britain, because of its interest for the empire, its uh, protection of that region in terms of what it would do as um, a, a post towards India, but also the whole uh, incidents with oil and Darcy and so on means that um, even now a whole generation of Iranians, probably the generation of my parents as opposed to mine, uh, believe that uh, uh, Britain controls everything in Iran even under Ayatollah Khamenei. And it's very hard to convince them that that isn't the case globally and definitely not the case in Iran. There is a book by Jack Straw. He's written a book called The Iranian Carter uh, Ingilisi uh, Hast, uh, which means it's the work of the British. So he's translated this exactly into English and he's written a book, uh, a recent book, uh, where he tries to explain this concept amongst the, in the mentality of Iranians in terms of how Britain controls almost everything inside Iran. It was inevitable, therefore, that at that period, we are talking of late 19th century and maybe very early 20th century, the United States appeared as an independent force, someone that wasn't Russia and wasn't England and uh, wasn't Britain, and was taking some interests in Iran. And therefore, um, a lot of people welcomed, if you like, the US uh, arrival. It was initially in terms of schools, education for girls was quite, uh, uh, my mother went in Tabriz to an American school for a while. And this was, um, if you like, westernization, but very slow westernization being taught to Iranians. Um, I'm moving fast through the 20th century now, but that's how I can only fit it in 40 minutes. During the Second World War, uh, partly because the Shah's father uh, supported Hitler and uh, was quite uh, sympathetic to the Nazis, uh, the Soviet Union occupied, the Allies decided to occupy Iran. The Soviet Union moved from the north and the British, uh, if you like, occupied the south of Iran. And again, during the Second World War, where some people realized why this had happened and weren't probably that worried about the deposed Shah moving to South Africa, where he eventually died, uh, there was, uh, this concept that the U.S. was the liberator, if you like, the U.S. was this independent force that wasn't going to harm um, Iran. And as a result, I think 
you can see the positive side of US throughout that Second World War period. Of course, the end of the Second World War uh, was the Shah's, the, the, ex, the last Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi's era. And um, he was very much considered someone who owed his throne to the British because that was how he managed to survive uh, the war. And of course, in 19, and as the nationalist movement gathered momentum, as Mossadegh tried to nationalize oil, as the left in the traditional kind of pro-Soviet Communist Party in the Tudor Party became stronger, as the workers became stronger, um, the West was quite worried about losing their ally in Iran, and that is the basis for the 1953 coup. Most people are familiar about it. Kim, uh, Roosevelt has written extensively. The CIA papers are out. The only people who deny that there was any US intervention are the royalists in Iran. They still believe their king was so popular that he genuinely got back to power. Uh, but again, the Iranian population, although it was quite clear that CIA was involved in this, at the time, Iranians still considered this very much to be a British intervention to bring back the Shah. The realization was slower coming. I mean, later, I think by the time people like me went to school, we were aware that the CIA was also involved. But it was still very much the sort that the it was a British coup to bring back the Shah. Um, the Shah's return to power was inevitably a period of very close relations with the West in general. And as the UK was, as Britain was reducing its influence throughout the world, I think it wasn't just Iran, and the United States was becoming much more involved in deciding not just politics, but the economics of the third world, Iran became very much part of that uh, arena. Uh, Kennedy uh, told the Shah he has to do white uh, reforms. These reforms took the form of the white revolution. The Shah's white revolution are very similar to, similar uh, to uh, so-called reforms in other countries where the United States basically wanted industrialization, modernization, the transformation into capitalist economies. The White Revolution is important because if you want to find the roots of the Islamic movement in Iran, the White Revolution is significant in that. Um, Many leftists opposed it because they thought it was dictated by US. It, the land reforms that the Shah produced was no land reform. It ended up leaving uh, landless peasants with no money to cultivate their land. They became the shantytown dwellers of major cities like Tehran and other cities. Um, the vote for women wasn't obviously contested by the left. The Islamists opposed the vote for women and land reform. And the land reform was less accentuated in their political propaganda. Uh, but I will talk later about Ayatollah Khamenei. Ayatollah Khamenei's biography talks of his first political speeches against the White Revolution, where he went to various places and talked against the White Revolution. For many of the liberals and the left in Iran, the White Revolution was a consolidation of the Shah's power, and for that reason they opposed it. And also uh, reforms that really were heralded with a referendum that got 99.9% .9 yes vote, but were, uh, were superficial and were dictated from the top. Um, the White Revolution probably paved the way for 1979 because the inequalities became much stronger. The corruption within the Shah's regime, as, as former landowners became industrialists and were gaining huge loans from government to become these industrialists, 
uh, increased resentment against the Shah. The Shah himself became far more dictatorial during this period. Uh, he had two political parties. The, uh, uh, he, he merged them into one and said, one is a yes party, the other is the of course party. I'm going to merge them into one party. They are all going to be of course party. And that was what happened. Rastakhiz was the party he created. And throughout this period, of course, the West was very much behind him. It wasn't just the, if you like, the visits to the UK or the US, the royal uh, presence, but also the fact that various US presidents referred to Iran as an island of stability. Um, the dissatisfaction in the shanty towns, I think the fact that repression had created this whole uh, uh, support for the left that was no longer just the um, pro-Soviet to the party, who had lost quite a lot of support because of its role in 1953. It's a long story, so I don't want to confuse people with that. But there was a new radical left of the early 1970s. There were supporters for that left in universities. The Shah had arrested large numbers of people for just supporting the left, not just being on the left. And therefore, there was uh, opposition from there. But the factors that changed, if you like, the fate of the Shah was probably uh, the uh, downturn in Iran's economy in the mid-70s and onwards, 76, 77, uh, despite the fact that throughout this period, his court was being really spending extravagant monies for everything. So the, there was, if you like, dissatisfaction amongst workers the satisfaction amongst ordinary people. But the groups that had maintained its political force were the, the clergy. The clergy, despite repression, had managed to maintain its organization and its force mainly because uh, the Shah considered himself a practicing Shia and didn't want to attack mosques, didn't want to attack the areas where uh, clergymen even held meetings. The worst that can happen, if you look at biography of Ayatollah Khamenei, he went for two months to prison. His equivalent left-wingers and people who actually knew him were all killed. So that's the difference between the way the Shah treated the Islamists and the, and the, op the left opposition. Um, it doesn't mean that the, le that the clergy did not have mass support. So they benefited from the relative freedoms they had. And there was this uh, concept in the Middle East and in Iran uh, in, in particular that liberation theology, which was uh, part of, if you like, Latin American uh, movements of the, of the center and the left, even the left, could be something that Iran could, um, could join. And therefore, if you like, the left wasn't antagonistic to the Islamic movement either in that way. Uh, the 1979 revolution, I think, came a as a shock for the West. They weren't prepared for it. They knew the Shah was facing problems, but they just didn't think it would happen like that. Six months earlier, I think it's the, the quote I used earlier, island of stability was the word used by Carter, I think. And uh, clearly, he didn't know. If you were in Iran at the time, you knew that this was, there was a lot of uh, this dissent. There was the, the rulers amongst themselves were divided. The Shah changed prime minister four or five times in the last two years. Um, he arrested his own prime minister and put him to pris in prison uh, because of the protest. Oil workers were uh, on strike. The civil servants went on strike. But at the same time, although the left knew and everybody else knew they were opposed to the Shah, it's a bit like right now. They didn't know what they wanted. They knew they didn't want the existing order. And it's in this period that, uh, of course, we see uh, the Shah's departure, the revolution of February 1979, 41 years in February 2020. 
Um, for the US, this was a major um, loss. I, I don't think for the West, I think. Um, it, it's worth telling you that uh, Iranian royalists actually still blame Carter and his human rights agenda <laughs> for the overthrow of the Shah. They think he was so popular that he couldn't have been overthrown if it wasn't for Carter. Uh, but apart from conspiracy theories of mad Iranians, um, <laughs> I think uh, the, uh, we have to admit that the clergy were in a position to be organized. They didn't present themselves as the force that would become completely, a, a, if you like, a, a theocratic dictatorship. They presented themselves as an alliance with the national movement. The, their allies in the government were people like Bazargan, who had been educated abroad, who uh, were part of, if you like, the religious side of the National Front, which was Mossadegh's uh, organization. So they had historic ties to the Mossadegh era. Quite a few of the ministers in the first uh, Khomeini government were of that order. Um, Chaos ensued. I, I'm cutting a very long story short, but inevitably chaos ensued. And although the government came to power, I think you could say the first year may be longer, but definitely the first year was a year where they, weren't, they were in power, but demonstrations continued. One of the biggest oil strikes in Iran took place after the Islamic government came to power, and very few people are aware of this. Um, this is the time when the U.S. embassy takeover and hostage taking took place. And this is a significant moment in Iranian history. I will look at it from two points of view, from Iran's point of view and from the United States. And I think it defines very much the last decades, the last four decades of Iran-U.S. relations, if not Iran-U.K. relations. The um, Islam Iranian students, Islamic students, took over the embassy. There is a debate whether the government was aware of it or not. Clearly, the Bazargan government wasn't aware of it. Whether the, the uh, if like hardline clergy were aware of it, I don't know. But it was a God's gift to the Islamic Republic. Uh, in many ways, it was a gift. Its first announcements were, there you are, we've, we've, you keep telling us we are compromising with US, we are not keeping up the slogans of the Iranian revolution. We've taken the nest of spies, and that's the, our credentials as the inheritors of the revolution must be accepted because we are doing it. But also, in response to the chaos, their, uh, re, re, their uh, answer was, we now need order. We need national unity. We have this big enemy, the United States. We have to unite. As you know, it was because the US was giving medical aid to the shop. But that was, if you like, the side story. The real story was what was going on inside the country. And in some ways, it showed the Iranian government that chaos can be beneficial, that living under a threat can actually benefit the government, in that you can unite everyone. They are still doing it. I will come back to it, but they are doing it today. Because people think, well, it's our national interest. There is a bigger enemy outside. And in this, they also managed to bring out the whole uh, well, anyone who is not supporting us might be associated with the CIA. They might be spies. Therefore, it justifies arresting. Leftists were arrested for being spies of the CIA. And, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we are talking of a time where the Soviet Union was still in existence, and the Soviet Union did support Iran, and its party supported Iran, the party associated with it. Um, for the US, it was also a significant time. Um, 
if you uh, remember, there was a helicopter that Carter sent to free the hostages. The helicopter collapsed in or fell in the desert. Uh, there was not even enough fuel, if I understand, if I remember correctly. And if you read memories, memoirs of people like Bannon or John Bolton, <coughs> they remember those days right until now. Bannon says he was on a ship in the Persian Gulf when the helicopter collapsed. And for him, this was the humiliation, the worst humiliation the United States had ever faced. And how could a third world country do this? And these are the people who later wanted to make America great, as you know. So they are. Um, so it was a significant moment. I think John Bolton uh, has memoirs of it. I don't know. I assume he wasn't as he was probably close to Reagan at the time. But uh, and Ronald Reagan did a very good um, got out of it very well because he managed to delay the release until the day Carter left. And it appeared as if Reagan had released, had achieved the release of hostages. L much later, in the late 1980s, we all learned that there was another story behind all of this. We, knew, we now know about Iran Gate and how throughout this period, when Iran was shouting death to America on demonstrations, there was negotiations happening with Ayatollah Khomeini's approval through a later, someone who later became president, Rafsanjani, with Oliver North, with McFarlane, and through them with Reagan. And there were, I won't go into it, but there were Swiss banks involved, the Nicaraguan Contras were involved, uh, money was being exchanged, uh, hostages were being released in Lebanon, and all sorts of things were happening. This is a lesson for Iran where it learned it can continue giving the slogan, death to America, but at the same time do business with the United States. For Iranians, it's a very sad saga because it's, it, it, it exemplifies the uh, emptiness of the anti-US slogans, in my opinion. I, didn't, I haven't said much about the Iran-Iraq war. It was a very difficult period for Iran. Throughout that war, the US, the UK, Saudi Arabia, most of the countries of the region supported Iraq. And uh, we, know, we know that arms sales, despite all the sanctions, despite all the talk, was going on from UK, uh, uh, in addition to anywhere else. But the end of the... Iran-Iraq war, which didn't end very well for Iran, in that it could have been in a better position had it accepted uh, the deal earlier. The same deal would have been available, as far as I know, or what Iranian politicians of both factions are saying nowadays, maybe three, four years earlier, with a lot, lot less loss of life. But anyway, the end of the Iran-Iraq war is the period of reconstruction. And reconstruction changes Iran's economic relations, Islamic Iran's rela economic relations with the West. Uh, reconstruction requires loans, requires IMF, requires the World Bank. And they were both eager to go, and Iranians were eager to accept. We are in the 1990s, um, late 1980s, but then 1990s and the early 2000s, the period of, um, if you like, major loans, but we did the regulations on Iran in terms of privatization, changing the status of nationalized industries, employment laws, trade union laws, and everything else, everything that we all know about. So this is a period where the reformist faction of the Islamic Republic becomes more prominent, partly because it's more in line with the economic realities of the country. Khatami's presidency is not an accident. Khatami, as the representative of the reformist faction of the regime, wants better relations with the West. And it's in line with the kind of politics that is going on. We then have we are now entering the early part of the 21st century. We are talking of 
two major wars in the, in the, in the region, Afghanistan and then Iraq. In terms of Afghanistan, Iran is very happy for the overthrow of the Taliban. Only a few months earlier, Iran could have gone to war against the Taliban. There was rumors that there might be a war. And in fact, if we understand uh, uh, Cro General Croker's memoirs, who, which has been published recently, and other memoirs, uh, Iranians gave the United States maps of um, aerial maps of where to target various places. And they were very helpful. And the US accepts that they were very helpful. Um, and then came 20, 2003. Everyone was telling Bush and Blair, this will strengthen the position of Iran in the region. You will remove their main enemy, Saddam Hussein. Uh, Iran has allies amongst the Shias in the south of the country. Iran will benefit. They didn't listen. Um, I think Iran was quite happy for the overthrow of Saddam. Not only was it a revenge for the Eight-Year War, but the peoples that the United States was uh, presenting as regime change people, uh, Chalabi included, but mainly the people who came later, Maleki, Nuri, all the other uh, leaders of uh, the of uh, prime ministers since occupation were people who were regular visitors to Iran. They actually did spend their exile during Saddam's time in Tehran. Um, the Kurdish leaders, the same. They were very closely associated with Iran. And therefore, for Iran, this was a golden opportunity. I realized that Iran's interventions in Iraq are resented by the Sunni population. And there are very good reasons for it, I have no doubt. But it's impossible to imagine that a country given that opportunity would say, oh, we will stay out of it. <laughs> we'll not interfere in Baghdad. We're going to just stay to our own territory. And in some ways, uh, Iran had, if you like, sought that by giving, or Khatami had sought that by giving this help to US, to Bush in particular, Iran would be in a different position. This is when Bush gave his speech, a, 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 a colleague of mine, or a, a more important member of St. Anthony's College always reminds me that uh, the, soon after um, Khatami had done all this and was visiting various countries, Bush announced Iran to be part of the axis of evil, a terrorist country. And this was a gift to the hardliners in Iran. This was Obviously, this is the best thing that could have happened for diminishing the role of the so-called reformers. So we enter a period where um, I think isolationists, populists such as Ahmadinejad gain more uh, popularity. They, they are in power. They become, they are not only, he's not just the president, the parliament in Iran is very much dominated by them. And in fact, again, it's a continuation of the same story in terms of the economy. The, Ahmadinejad is, did more privatizations than Khatami. It's during his period that Khamenei decided that a part of Iranian constitution, which is apparently you can't change, you can change the Quran, but you can't change Iran's constitution. Uh, that part in, which dealt with privatization could be changed. So Ayatollah Khamenei showed his pragmatism again by saying this particular part can be changed. But at the same time, we have the continuation of what I would call an independent foreign policy or attempts at an independent foreign policy. Because it's clear that the US doesn't want Iran as an ally. Under Bush, it doesn't want Iran as an ally. Under Obama, it doesn't. And obviously, under Trump, there was not, never going to be an ally. <clears throat> there is a lot said about Iran's foreign policy. And there is. The, if you like, it isn't a Shia empire that Iran wants. I think in, in Iran, unfortunately, the history of the Persian Empire 
remains this thought that at some stage we have to regain more land. We have to be bigger than what we are now. But I don't think that the Islamic Republic is either alone in this. I think <coughs> Iranians opposed to the Islamic Republic unfortunately have similar opinions. But also I Iran as a country under both Khomeini and Khamenei and various presidents that have been in power is very much pragmatic in its approach to foreign policy. So it tries to help the US. The US says, no, you can't be part of our circles. It goes and does something else. It's not, in, 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 between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it is, has been historically a much closer ally of Armenia than Azerbaijan Republic. Why? Because Azerbaijan's alliance with Turkey doesn't make it Iran's best ally. And therefore, Iran is much closer to Armenia. In terms of its interventions in Lebanon, they are historic. And they, haven't, they have always, I think quite a lot of the clerics have uh, re relations, relatives in Iran, uh, the Shia, Hezbollah relatives, uh, leaders. And therefore, there has been always this close relationship between Iran and Lebanon, and southern Lebanon in particular, and the Shia population. But I don't think Iran went out of its way to, if you like, uh, uh, influence Hezbollah. Hezbollah is very much part of Iranian Shia movement. It has always been. Uh, and in that way, I think um, one should see Iran's interventions in both southern Lebanon and in Iraq as um, not as part of that expansionist policy that I would associate with a Shia empire. It's more of a pragmatic approach in that it sees itself constantly under threat because it has picked up this independent foreign policy. And in this, although it's paranoid, we have to admit it has powerful enemies. Those powerful enemies, apart from anyone else, include Saudi Arabia and Israel, who are, who are keen for regime change in Iran at all times, and spend money and spend efforts to do that. As a result, Yes, Iran's intervention in Syria is probably one of the darkest times of Iran's history, because why is Iran in Syria at all? On the other hand, for the, the way it was justified, the way it was, uh, if you like, sold to Iranians, is that Islamic State is created by the Saudis, is a jihadi Sunni organization. It is may be representing genuinely the interests of the Sunnis in Iraq, but now it has become something else. And in becoming something else, it is decla its declared aim is to attack Iran. Its declared aim is to invade Tehran. I think the slogan al-Baghdadi, ex-deceased uh, leader of uh, IS, was saying was, today Damascus, tomorrow Tehran. And that's the way it's sold in Iran. I don't have enough information to tell you if this is true or not. I think the whole jihadi Salafi movement is so complicated that to explain whether there is, that this was a genuine threat or not, I don't want to go into it. But that's the justification used in Iran. However, the US then came up with, in recent years, has come up with two notions. One is the nuclear industry. And Iran's claim regarding its nuclear industry is that it is uh, up to the level of nuclear weapons, but below it. And I think many people who've stud studied Iran accept that, that Iran never reached nuclear arms capability. It went right to the level of it and stopped just below it. And there is also... <coughs> They put the argument, I, again, I can't tell because I don't know what 
um, nuclear industry producers. But they claim, as an oil producing country, in the long term, it would be cheaper to sell our oil and mm -hmm. use nuclear industry, nuclear energy internally. And that is economically better for us. I think there is also the fact that they came to the conclusion that in order to maintain an independent foreign policy, they needed some kind of nuclear deterrent, nuclear capability. Um, the deal, I won't go into details because I'm probably running out of time. The deal um, that Obama eventually signed with intervention of the European Union did control Iran's capability quite severely. So um, IAEA inspectors were regularly going to Tehran. Iran accepted all the limits that were put. To many Iranians inside the country, it looked like capitulation, to be honest. It looked like Iran had given in to a lot of the demands of the West. But I think most Iranians, again, like their government, are quite pragmatic. They thought, well, if it lifts the sanctions, if industry comes back, if we can get jobs, that's OK. Who cares? Obama uh, uh, signed the deal. As you know, Trump, throughout the election, was saying, this is a bad deal. This is a very bad deal. I mean, he never explained why it's a very bad deal. But he did say it's a bad deal, as we know. Now we know that from his advisors, not from his enemies, that the reason he didn't like it was because Obama had signed it. it he hadn't even read what, it was, what was in it. I think it was just one of those things. If Obama has signed it, it must be a bad deal. He then came out of it, uh, withdrew the United States, withdrew EU state. In practice, this means the deal is dead. The European Union talks of creating um, these um, financial um, zones where Iran can sell oil but buy food and medicine without dollar transactions so that the countries in, or the companies involved in these deals don't get penalized by billions of dollars from the United States. So that's the, the European agreement. It hasn't worked. As far as I know, it's still in discussion. Everyone keeps threatening and so on, but it hasn't worked. The Iranian opposition, in not just the royalists, but some deluded sections of the left and others who are even more deluded than the left, were really believed that Trump was going to change the regime in Iran. It's quite clear, in my opinion, from recent events that he never intended to do that. As in the case of Venezuela, as in the case of anywhere else where he has put maximum pressure, as he keeps saying, it's to get a better deal. He, de he looks at it like a business. He looks at it in the way of, we put the sanctions, they really suffer, then they come to the table. In the case of Iran, for various reasons, Iran isn't coming to the table. And it's now the US. As you know, before the impeachment story started <coughs> in August, September, he was sending phone numbers on his tweet to Iran's foreign minister to phone him. He was coming on television saying, why don't they come and talk to me? And this is after almost two years where everyone expected an attack on Iran. And for the people inside the country, it's a, it was a nightmare. I mean, now people are a bit more relaxed, maybe falsely more relaxed, but they're a bit more relaxed. But for literally two years, they were, they were saying, A, the sanctions are crippling our economy. Sanctions, as most of you know, but I will remind you, don't make the government weaker. They always strengthen the government. Because governments have access to currency at a different rate, to the real, the black market and the real rates that are available for others. So they become, if you like, the owners and the distributors of sanctioned goods. And therefore, both during Ahmadinejad, but during the current Rouhani period, in fact, it has strengthened the most 
terrible factions of the Iranian government by giving them both economic and political power. So they are the forces that have really benefited from sanctions. But for ordinary people, the, the situation is one of economic disaster and two of constant reminders that there could be an attack. Most people have said this, and I will argue that there isn't a chance of real, if you like, war with Iran because of the, uh, if you look, I read the US press regularly just to see what they think of attacking Iran. And in August and September, where there was a lot of tension, the tankers issue, uh, then the drone, the US drone was brought down by Iran. There's talks that, uh, as you know, Trump said, I was 10 minutes away from bombing Iran and, and so on. Um, throughout that period, the US press was saying, this is going to be a never-ending war. If we go into this, it will be a long war. It's a, a vast country. We've still not finished the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, which is true. Um, the war is still going on in both of those countries. But this will make those <coughs> wars look like nothing. And it's true, partly because I think as nationalism will encouraged Iranians opposed to the regime to fight the Americans, even if they don't fight with the government. But also, we are talking of a vast country. There are other scenarios, which I'm sure people like John Bolton were very keen about, which was dividing Iran into various nationalities and separating them all. So you would, if you like, solve the Iran problem once and for all, by creating Balochistan, the Arab region, the Kurdish Iran, northern Azerbaijan, and then there would be a small bit left, which would be the old Persian provinces. And there would be five countries, six countries. Depending on who you talk to, they were talking of five, six countries. Um, and that was one scenario. By late September, I think it was becoming already clear that that wasn't going to happen, that the maximum pressure was to uh, force Iran to accept a deal that included uh, restrictions on its missiles. And it's, I presume it's drones, but I, I'm not sure. And would include a statement regarding future interventions or stopping or uh, accepting that Iran will reduce its interventions in other countries in the, in the Middle East. Um, so throughout this period, I think Iran has managed to survive the sanctions, but just. And I still am surprised how it has survived. Assumptions are that the country is, that the government is uh, putting money in to keep the currency. The currency, the day Trump announced the withdrawal from the nuclear deal, the currency dropped to a third of its value against the dollar. And predictions were that this would just go up and up. I mean, people, Iranians, were really very concerned about this. The Iranian currency gained after this to about half. So it moved up a bit. And the disaster scenarios have yet not happened. But this doesn't mean that continuation of the current level of sanctions will not create more economic disasters. I think Iran has managed to find allies in Russia and China. And therefore, that has helped this, helped this economy and given it some levels of uh, support. But that, again, is a temporary situation. Um, will there be a deal? Will there be a no deal? There is a problem, and the problem remains the way Iran's supreme leader remains, uh, if you like, um, in this dual contradictory position. In this position, throughout his life, he has defended property, private property. <coughs> he has hated the left. He has opposed um, people who are, if you like, um, 
uh, communists or socialists, yes. But on the other hand, he is a create. Uh, he is not the king of Saudi Arabia. He is a modern man. He reads. He's actually a man of the 1970s. He's very similar in his mind, in his own opinions, to, if you like, Mugabe, Mandela, uh, the, if you like, the non-aligned movement of the 1970s. It's just that he hasn't moved on, and he doesn't seem to realize that in the absence of the Soviet <coughs> Union, the non-aligned movement has got a few problems. Um, he constantly talks of creating an e a resistant res economy of resistance, but he has, he has done absolutely nothing for this economy of resistance. And in a way, it's too late, it's too far gone. Iran is too much part of global capital, it's too much part of the IMF's um, agenda. It's too, too far gone into the whole system for a resistance economy, if one could do that in a single country and let it survive. In, in this contradiction, he believes he can survive and remain, if you like, the, the, the force that will oppose the United States in the region, despite Saudi Arabia's power, despite Israel, um, despite all the facts that don't uh, add up. At the end of the day, though, he's also a pragmatist. And when sanction, whenever sanctions become quite uh, penalized too much, the, the ordinary people, and his rule is endangered, he can make U-turns, dramatic U-turns. Uh, and in that way, who knows? Who knows whether he will accept a deal? My own interpretation is that between the two main characters, and I don't want to just summarize it in terms of Trump and Khamenei, they are, they are going in two separate directions. Trump wants a photo opportunity before 2020. He wants, he was desperate, as far as I can tell from Macron's office. He, uh, Macron organized a phone call between Rouhani and Trump in the UN, when they were both in the UN. And Trump was on the phone and Rouhani refused at the last minute, right? The problem is, Khamenei wants a deal, but wants a deal in secret, like Iran did. Something that would have no photos, no apparent signs to it, but at the same time gradually solves Iran's economic problem. And there is a deal, there is a nuclear uh, agreement signed, but there isn't a photo opportunity. Uh, <laughs> And he has a point in that. I think he has a point. Look at the photo opportunities with North Korea. Very little has come out. I mean, that we don't even have an A4 page out of it. You know, there's nothing out of it. So he has a, in some ways, he has a point. And his, if you like, his last condition seems to be sanctions have to be removed before um, we can get into a deal. That seems to be his position. I understand that's also Kim of Jung's <laughs> position, but the similarities end there. So we are in a very dangerous position. I think for ordinary Iranians, the last two years, two and a half years, have been dramatic, dr drastic times. But what Trump and his, uh, more than Trump, what Bolton, Bannon, and the supporters of regime change from above don't seem to realize is that the more they appear to be calling for war or more sanctions, the more they lose people inside the country. Mm -hmm. People inside the country have gone to a stage where they say, the enemy we know, the, the, the Satan we know, who is the current Islamic Republic, is better than the unknown. And they look around themselves, and there isn't anything to advertise Iraq Afghanistan or Libya. And that is the best gift that the US has given to this government. And the government is aware of it. So I think this 
situation will last for a bit longer. I think in the long term, there will be a deal, but it might not happen under the current administration, <laughs> partly because Trump is too busy right now, as far as I can see, <laughs> to be dealing with the Iran situation. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. international perspective on everything. Would you like to take questions singly or two or three together? Uh, two, no, two, three. A couple of, two or three, okay. Um, I'm afraid our roving mic does not work today, so people are going to have to stand up and speak clearly. Tell us a little bit more about the democratically elected socialist government before the last saw that was coupled by the CIA. I'm not so clear on that. Thank you. And the gentleman there in the blue? Um, I've got uh, two questions. One, one is uh, one which you you may not either want to or feel capable of answering, which is what would uh, Islamic uh, liberation theology have looked like? Um, the other is um, uh, what is the purpose, do you think, of this policy of arresting uh, dual nationals? Um, I'm sorry. Nazanin. Yes, um, um, and there's the, a few. But there are, but there are lots. Well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, it was a. Okay, Mossadegh was a nationalist. He led the National Front in Iran. Uh, national Front wasn't right wing as in National Front, but uh, it was. Um, The main, the main slogan of that government was nationalizing Iranian oil and removing the interests of foreign companies. Um, his allies at the time were at times the, the communists, the two de party, who had workers' support and who had organizational support in parts of Iran. Um, he fell out at times with his allies. There, is, there was the complication of the Soviet influence on the Tudor party. The Soviet influence meant that they didn't want, uh, they also didn't want to lose any right to the Caspian oil in the north. And therefore, Tudor took a, a, a difficult and at times contradictory position about nationalization of oil. Um, they, it, but it was a popular, popular elected government. It is considered by many, I think, in the <coughs> Middle East, it was the only genuinely elected government of the 1950s that didn't come to power through a coup. There was no military involvement. It was an election. The Shah was in power. The constitution was a constitutional monarchy. And in some ways, the Shah should have accepted the rule of this prime minister. And he was ready to accept the Shah. Uh, the slogan, I think, at the time was, <laughs> the Shah should reign but not rule, something of words like that. And, uh, and the Americans got involved mainly to support the Shah. It wasn't even just about nationalization of oil, because later, in many ways, the oil was given to, nationalized by the Shahs, and by the Shah and his ministers. Um, Islamic liberation theology had representatives who were speakers like Shariati. At the time, uh, the Mujahideen Khal, who are now something completely different, Giuliani's mob, I call them, Moonies, in Iranian Moonies and Giuliani's supporters. But at the time, the Mujahideen represented that. And in some ways, they did talk of um, egalitarianism, um, ex uh, at least fighting the excesses of what they called, borrowing from the left, comprador bourgeoisie in Iran. So they used some of the terminology of the left. Uh, they were closely associated with some people on the left, and they did uh, 
um, have representatives, they gained a lot of support before the revolution, just before the revolution, because of their um, the younger generations that were supporting them, because of popularity of Shariati himself, who was a good speaker. Um, and um, there is very little left of that. Um, it's a long story, but there, is, there was also a split in the Mujahideen before the Shah's downfall. Some actually became Marxist, and therefore the ones who stayed resented this. There was quite a bit of infighting and a nasty story, and that resulted in a situation where I think the ones who remained religious became more closer to Ayatollah Rafsanjani, for example, or the existing religious movement. Um, the arresting of dual nationals, quite a lot of arrests in Iran are recently quite irrational, in, in many ways irrational. So the accusation as, low, as soon as you have, there are m millions of Iranians with dual nationality because 40 years people have been in, not necessarily in exile, they've come as postgraduates, they've come as students, and they've stayed, and they therefore have dual nationals. Uh, the idea is that let us use the threat of US or foreign forces to frighten. I think it's an attempt at frightening ordinary Iranians. Because it, we know here, and the press talks about these arrests, but the arrests are irrational of other people. There was a demonstration on the 1st of May 2019 in support of sugarcane workers. About 18 people were arrested. Some of them were given 10 to 15 year prison sentence. On Saturday, I assume because there's so much uh, protests against this, some of them are released, but only on temporary, on what we call leave from prison. But the reality is that it is uh, a, the foreign enemy, as I said during the Iran embassy, the American embassy situation, shows the government that, that you can use that. You, you say everyone can be a spy. They, you arrest people, they have to prove they're not a spy. You don't, you assume guilt until they can prove <coughs> otherwise. And that leads to unbelievable stories like Nazani or anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lady there. Um, during the time of the Iran-Iraq war, I was teaching in a further education college. And we had a group of budding engineers, 32 in the class, of whom 31 were from Iran and one was from Iraq. Um, it was very interesting to me because there was no dissension at all in the group. And they, these were all young people. They were 17, 18, 19, mostly 17. Um, they all said the, the, the war is between the governments. It's not between the people. We don't care. And I wondered what you thought about that. I've been wondering about that since then. Thank you. Gentleman here. What is the um, actual effect of sanctions within uh, the country? I mean, we, we hear about shortages of medicines in hospitals and shortages of food, but what is it actually like for the average, you know, proverbial man and woman in the street? Thank you. Um, okay. It's very difficult to say who started the war. I've always got problems with this because Iran was agitating the Shia population of Iraq um, as soon as the government came to power in 1979. And Saddam was being urged by the West, why don't you invade? <laughs> and, uh, and he did. As, uh, uh, in fact, uh, many say it was very much an, in the initiation of the U US that he did. Yes, it's true that the war was between the governments. But I think for people who were in the country, in both countries, and faced, if you like, missiles coming over their heads and being scared of their, for their lives because there was literally bombing of streets. These missiles destroyed 
whole streets in Tehran, for example, people started to resent each other. Um, I can see that younger people, especially outside Iran, wouldn't have seen that. And if you meet Iraqis, we are very similar. We don't speak the same language. They speak Arabic, we speak Persian. But in terms of the food we eat, the way we work, especially if you meet Shia Iraqis, they are much more, they eat the similar, much more similar foods. They have the same ceremonies. They have the same rel religious customs and Iranian. So I can see that people don't see it as people being close in that way. But, but there were times when, and at times you hear now, for example, there is, I know that in Iraq there are people now protesting, saying Iranians get out. This means Iranian influence in the Iraqi government. But at the same time, you also have Iranians who are saying, well, these Iraqis, we paid such a heavy price and we've been supporting them since 2003, which might not be true, but that's the way people's mind thinks. So there is an element of truth in what you've heard, but there is, a, if you like, more layers to this story. Um, OK, so the first thing that sanctions did was that foreign companies left Iran in large numbers. So Iran had a, has and had, um, historically, a car manufacturing industry, for example. It, had, it exported cars to its neighbors. And Peugeot Citroën left almost immediately because of sanctions. That has led to mass unemployment, not just in workers, but for example, and I come across a lot of that amongst people I meet as postgraduates, amongst postgraduates, amongst people with PhD who's who worked in research and development in metallurgy, in car simulation, in fluid dynamics, engineers, scientists, they all, they all became unemployed. Whole sections of the university collapsed because of that. Then you have the banking sector. Now, the, uh, quite a lot of these big industries had become major financial powers in Iran. So something like the uh, Saipo um, uh, car manufacturer is also owner of a bank and a number of uh, insurance companies. Now, the departure by South Koreans means that those companies are also gone. And there is a whole series of events like that. So a grad, uh, Iran has many universities, has probably the largest number of universities in the region. Uh, every small town I hear has a university. And some of them are just pretty average. Some are very poor. Some are very good universities. But a graduate nowadays in Tehran has to do three or four jobs. Most of them, not the gig economy, but driving taxi, selling something on a corner of a street, doing some teaching on the side in order to survive. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is food shortages. There is shortage of specific items. Um, and they go in the waves. And I think that's to do with the black market as well, because there's a shortage and the black market flourishes in that, and then it actually becomes more available. Um, the medical shortages are not just in terms of medication, but also surgical equipment. For example, quite a lot of, for some reason, the United States claims that baby baby incubators for premature babies has a dual use. It can be used in nuclear. It, apparently, it can. It's not, a, it's not there. Uh, if you like, it's not a lie. But, uh, but on the other hand, you know, so what? So uh, apparently, that can be dual used. So there's a major uh, shortage of uh, incubators for premature babies. They've now decided to bring some from China or somewhere else. So it has that kind of effect, but I think it's the despair. If you talk at, to young Iranians who've recently come out, like I meet students postgraduate, they all say there is no hope in the country for the future. 
And I can see that because all you can see is departure. You can, all you can see is moving out of the country, and that must be depressing. So, gentleman here. Yes, um, I'm interested about the American foreign policy towards uh, Iran. It doesn't seem to be uh, been very successful in that it's created a society, uh, a government that can only survive by being opposed to American interests, while the economy of Iran and the economy of America are both neocon. I mean, they, it doesn't look like two states that should be it enemies. Uh, I was wondering if the U.S. could have had a different strategy other than uh, regime change from the top. If they perhaps uh, backed the clergy on the grounds that they obviously weren't socialists, uh, really, uh, <laughs> or if it had become fair on the clergy, that they might have got uh, regime change from inside much more successfully. Uh, I mean, the Americans seem to be very good at messing things up in the Middle East. <laughs> Thank you. David, you had a question. Yes, uh, apart from the anomaly of where nuclear states that have nuclear weapons uh, would like to prevent any other country having nuclear weapons, even though they themselves don't follow nuclear non proliferation treaties, uh, could you comment on the fact that before the Shah was deposed, America had not only sold nuclear product to Martin, it's installed it, built it, but then trained Iranian you know, engineers in MIT in the US. Uh, as part of the so-called Atoms of Peace program. So they, they in fact, distributed this, this technology, and now they're objecting to the fact that they're able to have it. Actually, I Just wanted three, to three, ask you something, three, if that's okay. Um, thinking about this, I got slightly confused that um, there was clearly a sort of um, Iran and the US were getting on quite well at the time of 2003 and uh, the deposition of Hussein uh, and the invasion, sorry. And then they became part of the axis of evil and I'm just not quite clear exactly how that twist happens. And this lady here. Um, I've enjoyed it very much. I'd like to ask how much of a threat is Israel to Iran? And what, if anything, can the European Union uh, to try and ameliorate the situation. Okay, I'll try. Okay. Um, yes, you. I mean, to say that U.S. foreign policy, it it seems to me it's dictated by the events of the months. I mean, if you think of it, what was the point of overthrowing Saddam? You know, if you really think about it. He had followed everything they had said. OK, he disobeyed or misunderstood regarding Kuwait. He shouldn't have gone in. Yes, that's by, by all accounts. Somebody said something, he misunderstood. But he, they had survived with him afterwards. So what was the point of overthrowing Saddam? If you look at the response of the United States to the events of two, 2001, 11th of September, uh, there is a, on social media, there is something going around saying um, uh, in, Afghanistan was invaded, then Saddam Hussein, if you remember, both Bush and Blair were trying to make some unbelievable connection between Saddam and 11th of September. Well, there was no connection. I mean, everyone knew there was no connection. But um, there was no mention of, of the fact that the 20 of the 21 individuals all had Saudi passports. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there was no, you know. So in a way, yes, it's irrational. There's nothing. There's nothing long term. You would have thought a rational thought would have been to go and discuss this with your ally Saudi Arabia, and try and organize something differently there. But no, the attack on. Um, on uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan happened. The problem, I think, for um, the United States is that A, it can't forgive the Iranian people for the revolution of 1979, the leaders of Iran for the hostage taking of 1979, and it doesn't trust either the people or the leaders. And as a result, it deals with what it can it sees at 
as long-term allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel. And they're constantly saying Iran is the terrorist state, this is the axis of evil, and that really is an important factor. It's not that they decide, but I think their influence is heard in some circles more than others. Um, I don't... The, the economy is something quite different, because nowhere in the world, I mean, is the economy different anywhere else. In a way, uh, the dominance of this form of capitalism is so prevalent that uh, it's not just Iran who's following these rules, almost every country. But it has to be said that Iran, from students who've gone and studied Iran, uh, Iran's uh, protests and worker struggles, Iran embarked on neoliberal economy with much more enthusiasm than many countries of the region. For example, uh, a, a friend who went to Iran and met the departments of economics was telling me that not a single department is there any challenge to neoliberal uh, economic agenda being taught. Uh, I know that's true of most UK universities, but at least where I am, some people do challenge it, or in Cambridge there are academics who do challenge it. So it's not universal, but in Iran everyone has espoused, but the Islamists have espoused the neoliberal economic agenda. Um, that's all I can say on this. Okay, um, in terms of the uh, atomic nuclear thing, yes, the, the, the British also helped um, uh, Tony Benn was Minister of Energy, and later, he, in, later in life, he regretted his own role. He actually spoke against uh, his own involvement at the time. Uh, but the Americans were very much uh, part of it, and the idea was this modern Iran will have a nuclear, will become the next nuclear power. And maybe unlike Israel, we don't even need to hide it. We can say Iran has <laughs> nuclear weapons. Because Israel could keep saying we don't have any nuclear weapons, you realize. It's a, apparently it's a textile factory, the last I heard. Uh, the fact that people get nuclear radiation from it is a different story. <laughs> but uh, um, So yes, the idea was definitely that. Now, in some ways, it is the same industry. In fact, nothing changed. So quite a lot of industries kept going after the Shah's overthrow, and this was one of them. I know people who worked there, and both before the overthrow of the Shah and later, and they all had very serious concerns, these were scientists, about lack of um, if you like health and security. Their main problem wasn't the bomb. It was that the discipline, you have to be very disciplined with radiation. It's not a joke. You have to be quite concerned about nuclear waste and <coughs> the actual industry. And they were very concerned about absence of um, measure, adequate measures. People go around without the radiation badge that is supposed to stop the radiation. And no one checks whether you're wearing the right equipment, the right gear, and so on. And there is also a lot of concern about nuclear waste in Iran and where it goes. And that's another story. So I suppose as, a, as, a, as an Iranian, I wish Iran didn't have the nuclear industry under the Shah or under this government. But that's uh, politically, you can see why both, both times of the revolution they kept it. The US's position is, uh, quite um, unbelievable. I mean, um, the, the, I think what happened in 2003 was the neocons in the Bush administration, and remember John Bolton was an, an advisor, Cheney was a neocon, quite a lot of close allies of him were, were saying Iran can become very powerful and it's a danger. And remember, this is a time when the Sunni rebellions in North Iraq were beginning to happen. And Saudi Arabia was clearly getting involved with them. So as far as the Saudis were concerned, a new set of wars, a new agenda was already being uh, prepared in terms of Sunni-Shia conflict, 
but also let's limit Iran's influence in southern Iraq. If we can't stop it, let's limit it. And therefore, rapprochement with Iran in the Bush era wouldn't have worked. Then Iran had Ahmadinejad, who created his own, you know, had all sorts of stories. Um, I mean, nowadays he's pro-American. You won't believe it, but uh, you know, at the time, um, irrespective of what was discussed, the Holocaust conference he set up was a disaster. Um, I think he, he it, rather than being a Shia Islamist, he was a hardline nationalist Iranian, a bit like the Shah's father. In fact, for many Iranians, some of the things he was saying were reminiscent of the Nazism of the Shah's father. He wasn't a Nazi, but some of the things he was saying, unlike the Shah's father, who was a Nazi. But <laughs> uh, I think Ahmadinejad created a situation where no US presidents could touch Iran. I might be wrong on that. Um, I think the point about Israel is very important. So as far as Israel is concerned, any rapprochement with Iran by the US is a danger. Israel sees Iran as a rival. It was OK under the Shah because the Shah was pro-Israeli. But uh, Iran close to US or the West, any Western country, uh, might improve Iran's position and reduce Israel's, um, if you like, uh, importance in the region as a, uh, as a uh, so they are competitors and enemies, yes. I mean, uh, the Palestinians often tell you that Iran hasn't done much for the Palestinians. And in some way, I would say that's true. Slogans every day. Every day Iranians give slogans about Palestine. What have they done in practice? Very little. Uh, definitely not with Hamas, definitely not with the West Bank, uh, the Fatah organization. But one could say that, if you like, for the Iranian clergy, Palestine is one of the causes that they like to hold the flag, but no, do very little. So Iran isn't a threat to Israel in that way, except that if the US wants to invade Iran, there, is, there has always been the talk that Israel would provide the air power, or could initially, uh, initiate the air raids on Iran. The problem there is that Hezbollah will attack with missiles given by Iran uh, parts of Israel. And therefore, Israel sees Iran as a threat. Iran sees Israel as a threat. And I think the animosity is quite strong, despite the fact that during a very short period, two presidents, Khatami and the president of Israel, both came from the same small town in southern Iran called Yazd. <laughs> uh, and, and one thing that I should add uh, is that the Jewish populations that stayed in Iran, a very large proportion of the community had to leave in 1979. But the populations that have stayed in Iran is now not at all interested in going to Israel, despite Netanyahu's regular invitations. And they make it absolutely clear they have no, they consider themselves Iranian and they don't want to go. And compared to some Middle Eastern country, including Iran's own history, I, as far as I can tell, they are not discriminated against. They have their own MPs and they have their own community and they are allowed to practice. The EU bit. Oh, sorry, the EU. <laughs> OK, the EU is in a very difficult situation. So the EU wants to have deals with Iran, economic deals with Iran. Uh, apart from anything else, they see it as a young, uh, skilled, educated country where they can, for example, send offshore a lot of uh, service sector on IT, as, as an example, in the same way that they use Egypt now for that. Um, they can't do much because of the way the US controls finance. 
So any transaction between EU banks or EU companies and Iran is, has to be done in dollar, is converted in dollar. And therefore, the US becomes aware of that transaction. Many companies fear what they call secondary sanctions. So if you are, uh, someone was giving an example of, say, BMW or Nissan, or not Nissan, uh, Peugeot, a French company. Um, if you consider your market globally, and then Iran, it's not, Iran is not worth taking the risk of getting sanctioned. You might not get sanctioned, right? So not everything that is trans, not every transaction gets a sanction. But the United States has made it very clear that you choose. That's why the EU set up Instex. Instex is this um, supposedly virtual financial environment where transactions are not in dollar. But that requires a lot of will, not just by Germany, France, Britain, who are picking this up, but also the European Central Bank and the whole uh, financial sector. It's a constant struggle. It's not finished. It's going on. But the EU has its own problems when it comes to that. So country, the EU governments have signed signed up renewals of the nuclear treaty, and they keep saying, we will do it. But they can't control the companies. Quite a lot of these companies have, are either multinationals or they are fearful of their non-Iran market. Gentlemen, um, historically, what is the main core of the antagonism that, the, um, that Saudi Arabia has for Iran? And the lady at the back. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, could you say something about Iran's relationship with Russia and China? I mean, I never can understand why they can't just sell their oil to somebody else. <laughs> Those are the two we've got at the moment. Oh, there's one there. Lady there. Yeah, um, I want to ask two questions. One is that um, why doesn't China now come in? Because of the sanctions, why does this leave the way open for, for China to come in? Um, this must be a remark. And perhaps on a slightly lighter note, I recently saw a film called um, Tehran City of Love. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, and I don't know if it was made in Tehran, but it gave the impression that actually. Um, the country was not as socially conservative as it used to be, um, and was really modernised. And I wonder how representative that that was. Um, <coughs> yes, the, the Saudi. <laughs> I think Iranians have never forgiven Arabs for uh, destroying the Sassanid Empire. <laughs> when and, was that? <laughs> Uh, 1,398 years ago. <laughs> well, you know exactly. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> yes, because, because our calendar starts with the Islamic. So the Shah changed the calendar to 2,500 years plus the extra. But yes, it's, 1, 000, it's 14, 14th century, basically. Um, and the Iranians consider, I mean, this is in the myth, the way the poetry, the customs, the literature has moved on. It's not just, um, if you like, old wives' tales, but uh, the fact that the story, the poetry, is, to be, to put it bluntly, anti-Arab. Right? So there are poets, Iranian poets, post-Islamic era, who have written books about Persia and how uh, you know the Arabs destroyed it. These were savages. We had an empire. L little do they mention the fact that this empire must be must have been on its knees if it collapsed so quickly, which it did. But anyway, that's nostalgia for you. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I was mainly interested in the other way around, actually. Did the, the Saudi Arabia? Oh, why do the Saudi? <coughs> okay, okay. So the. The, I think it's the two. So Iran initiated Shia religion, which has quite a lot of the customs of the Sassanid era. 
And for Saudi Arabia, this is hereticism in some ways. I mean, Baghdadi expressed it very well. He said, Shias are not Muslims. And this is the opinion of the clergy in Saudi Arabia. This is the ideology of uh, major you know, Salafis and jihadists. These people have destroyed Islam. They've made it into something that is Iranian, is not really Islam. But the current Saudi leaders are also uh, dislike the, if you like, the uh, <coughs> political influence of Iran in the region. In the absence of Saddam Hussein, Iran has got a lot of influence in Iraq. The Saudis show this map that shows an, a Shia belt that goes from South Lebanon, it kind of waves around a bit, but it goes through South Lebanon, it's got occasionally Syria, but sometimes not Syria. Then it's got Iraq, then it's Iran, and then there is the Daris in Afghanistan as well, the, the Persian-speaking Afghans. And it says, look, they've, what is this? They've kind of taken over the Middle East, and that is a rivalry. Um, I think that is probably all I can say about that. Uh, in terms of Russia and China, I think one of the issues is that for the United States, one of the main issues isn't um, oil in the Gulf, is, not, is reducing China's access to cheap oil in Iran and in that area. It's part of long term. We talked about the short term. Um, tactics of the United States. There are also long-term policies. And the long-term, I think that does make sense. China does have deals with Iran. And now, as far as we know, some of the money that is saving Iran is because Iran is selling oil to China. Right? But Chinese companies are also involved, like European companies, are involved in international markets, in international trade. And China is refusing, as, has withdrawn for, from some of the, what I would call, major investments. So there was an oil field, oil and petrochemical complex in South Iran called Pars Fields. And China withdrew from this uh, this year, in 2019. So China, although um, helps Iran, is economically involved with Iran. It also has its own problems. So whoever was, I assume there was some kind of state, but part state, part privatized petrochemical major Chinese company, they didn't want to be sanctioned, and they withdrew. Uh, and it shows, in many ways, all of this shows the economic power of the United States in the way it monitors transactions globally, but it can also uh, stop these sanctions. You know, uh, even the threat of secondary sanctions stops such uh, movements. In terms of Russia, you have to think that Russia has, it, as far as I know, its own oil and gas. So it's not an importer of oil. Um, Russia has helped Iran in terms of military equipment. Um, what you have to think is that military equipment in Russia is probably nowhere near as good as it was, and it's definitely not as good as, as the West. And so what Iran gets out of that is probably not good enough for preparing for a war against a superpower or anything anywhere near. Um, Iran has bought a lot of civilian planes from Russia, because aerospace is Iran and aeroplanes you can't, Iran airplanes, which are carrying civilians, can't get spare parts in Israel airport, right? They're part of the sanction. So uh, Iran has bought a lot of um, um, airplanes from Russia. Most of my relatives tell me they are very unreliable. They all pray when they get into them. And they're not, they're not very good planes. But Russia is the only country selling. The other planes Iran has are very old. Or there was, there was a period where French Airbus was selling to Iran. I think now they've stopped, but for a short time they did. So 
if you like, Iran's air industry is reliant on, on Russia more than anything else, and weapons. Um, Tehran as a city. I think one of the most amazing things about Iran's Islamic Republic is that it has completely and utterly failed to create an Islamic nation. <laughs> and they admit it. I mean, uh, if you listen to some of the clerics, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei, all of them, they would tell you this. So, in a country where, during the Shah's times, there were more young Iranians becoming Islamist than there are under this republic. So, the two, I think, three quarter of the population is under thirty. That's quite a large proportion of the population. And this is a generation, not just post-revolution, this is a post-war. In Iran, it's very important. They tell you the ones born during the war with Iraq are uh, nice young kids who, are, who accept that you have to be very modest. The post-war Iranians are very demanding. This is where you know, the whole economy was booming and so on. This generation is very westernized. It's also come about at a time when uh, technology is the world. You know, everyone has iPhones. Everyone is looking at the world. So in this generation, I think you would say there is uh, people are very liberal in their attitudes. Girls wear the headscarf but resent it. Young girls resent it more than their elder sisters, and the elder sister resents it more than the mother. So as generations have come up, and you can see the headscarf is now, in most parts of Iran, is now reduced to something you wear over uh, what I would call non-natural hair color, <laughs> blondes. <laughs> most Iranian girls I see are blondes uh, in photos, in family relatives, in films, and so on. And in some ways, the, the Islamic, uh, I, when I appear on BBC television, uh, I sometimes read comments pe have, people have put under it. And from inside Iran, they all say, why is she dressed so conservatively? <laughs> <laughs> Nine out of ten, I, it's not just one or two. I mean, I'm not exact. Most of them are saying, she's not religious. Why is she wearing conservative clothes? This is because. Most presenters, even on Iranian TV, would be wearing more makeup than I do. They might wear a headcloth somewhere behind their head, but they would be uh, more um, colorful, more uh, open, and so on. And this is reflected in, for example, the attitude of youth towards drinking, towards parties, towards going out, towards everything. It also is a country where people are thriving for education. And it's partly because that is one way out of misery. So this large population with an economy that did well but then stopped, it has got major problems. And in some ways, uh, ed studying is one way of either gaining access to a European or American university or at least improving your status in the country. So it's a very, um, I, I say the hope uh, of Iran is that younger generation, despite the fact that a minority of them are probably influenced too much by um, trashy TV or US TV or so on. But I think that is still a minority. Thank you very much. A couple more questions. A gentleman yeah, here. Yeah, okay. so regarding Saudi Arabia, uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that Kuwait uh, and the oil producing regions of Saudi Arabia, and certainly Bahrain, have a huge underclass of Arabic speaking Shias, most of whom have Persian names. And they are revolutionary, and that I think, rightly or wrongly, that revolutionary tendency is blamed on Iran, and it has been for the last 20 years. Very true. No, sorry, that is very true. Sorry, no, 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 that's, that's yeah. exactly, no, no, that's that's it. Gentleman there? How neoliberal is Iran these days? How, oh, sorry? Neoliberal. Oh, right, okay, thank you. And the lady here, did you have a question? Or? 
No, no, sorry. No. Okay. Any, one, we've got time for one more if anyone's got one. Okay. What do you think the effect on the Middle East will be of the uh, death of Baghdadi? Okay. And this lady here, because you haven't asked. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, what is the legal system and what's the positions of the women? Okay. Four quick questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I, I, I agree entirely, and I should have said um, the new about the Arabs, uh, the Iranian, the, the, the Bahraini situation. Bahrain, sorry, the Bahrain situation in particular is very sensitive. Um, okay, so there is a lot of study done on um, privatization in Iran. I'm trying to do one of them, but there's others who've done a lot of work. And like anywhere else in the third world, privatization, which is going full steam ahead, uh, has its own peculiarities. Privatization takes the form of that country's economy in most places, and it's, that's what it's done in Iran. So a lot of, if you like, right-wing pro-capitalist people will tell me, oh no, this is not real privatization because the cronies around the regime are benefiting or revolutionary guards are getting privatized. But you could say that about Eastern Europe. You could say that about Latin America. I would argue you could say that about sections of privatization in Britain a long time ago. But putting that aside, that is going full steam, right? So, okay, revolutionary guard institutions or the, the foundation for the dispossessed are, for example, buying parts of these privatized national industries. The telecom has been privatized, trains have been privatized, bus companies have been privatized, airline is privatized, everything is being privatized. But then within them, the people close to circles of power ha are gaining huge uh, fortunes. Just to give you an example, there's a trial going on in Iran of a man called Zanjani, who was a close friend and ally of Ahmadinejad. And his corruption case deals with $42 billion. Right? So that is the figure the government says he's stolen. Right? And the, we know a lot about corruption in Iran and this type of privatization and how neoliberal economy is doing no trickle down, it's just moving up. Because there are more than one, more than two factions in the Iranian government. And these factions keep exposing each other. So the reformists <laughs> expose the conservatives. And now Rouhani's brother is facing a five year jail sentence because he's accused of being involved in an export uh, privatization case. Ha ha uh, Rouhani's former minister for economy is also involved. And we are talking of billions of dollars. So yes, privatization isn't going to shareholders who are former employees of these companies, but as you know, neither British Telecom didn't exactly go to the ones who bought one pound shares. It went somewhere else. So it's taking its toll. In terms of employment, they were very good. So, for example, uh, the, they exempted workshops of less than 10 person from any, legal, uh, any labor legislation. The country's labor legislation is quite flexible in favor of the owner anyway. In any dispute where privatization has led, or other events have led to sackings, to unemployment, or anything else, the state intervention is on the side of the employer. You, we have not seen a single strike, for example, in Haftap, the sugarcane company, in the bus company in Tehran, in any of these, where events have escalated from a small strike into a bigger strike, we have not seen a single case where the state has come on the side of the workers. And the legislation is constantly encouraging contract work, 
white contract. That's even more neoliberal than the zero hour. So you sign a white piece of paper when you're employed. The employer then writes the case afterwards. So he can say, I'm sacking you tomorrow, and that's it. You've signed it. You know, So you can't take him to any... Uh, he's, it's, most workers, when they are opposing the labor legislation, talk of these white contracts. And I didn't know. I kept thinking, what is a white contract? Until someone explained it. So in those ways, I would say that's how neoliberal it is. And in terms of education, I think universities. I mean, there's a couple of academics who write against, and they keep, I'm in contact with them, and they keep telling me it's like we, are, we feel completely isolated in this sea of uh, neoliberalism. Um, Death of Baghdadi, I really don't think it matters a lot. I think if it had happened when he had 8 million in his territories, they say now he controlled 8 million, the two, the two areas, it might have. I think he was isolated, he was in retreat. The question remains, will Saudi Arabia, will the Gulf countries finance people like him? other people who will come out because of their interests? Will there be new Salafi jihadi movement? As an individual, I think he was dead because of his political situation. Uh, he didn't control territory. I don't think there were a lot of ex-IS people. It could be the reverse, that he does become a hero. I can't say that. but. He wasn't at his height when he was killed. And in some ways, I think what we, will, we might witness, unfortunately, is a new form. In the same way that, if you like, uh, Daesh was a restructuring of Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, and it became then Islamic State. It might change in its formation. It might become, we might witness new forms of jihadi, Salafi, organizations, but as an individual, I don't think so, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, in terms of Iran's legal system, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to be fair. Uh, so the major laws are based on Sharia, on Islamic Sharia, but you have to remember that even under the Shah, that was similar. So although Iran has a legal system that deals with a lot of issues beyond the Sharia, but, uh, uh, that had a different legal system under the Shah, it's still that legal system followed quite uh, strictly Islamic rules. In terms of inheritance, for example, a man uh, gets twice what a woman gets. Um, in terms of uh, uh, divorce in terms of leaving the country without the permission of your father or your um, uh, male guardian. Um, so these were the same even under the Shah. What has changed in terms of Sharia law are the introduction of what Iranians rightly call more medieval uh, Sharia laws, like the law of retribution. Um, the law of retribution is very much an Islamic medieval law. Um, uh, I kill someone. If the relatives of that person accept payment from me, I can go free. And there is no, the state doesn't take up the case anymore. It's important because there is a case of a former minister, a reformist minister, who killed his second wife. And he has recently paid the relatives of that wife. And that's it. I think he will be out soon. So the law of retribution is pretty awful. The inheritance law remains as it was. There was a law, even under the Shah's time, where the children born to Iranian women who were married to non-Iranians couldn't take Iranian nationality. The Iranian parliament recently changed that. Uh, mainly because there is a famous case of this mathematician who died and her daughter is American-Iranian, but Iran wants her to be able to say I'm Iranian. Uh, in terms of 
other aspects of the legal uh, system, I think you have to, and the women's position, because you asked, I think women have fought very hard to win rights within the Islamic Republic. And in that way, I think they have been successful. It's come at a very heavy price through fighting every step of the way. But they have, for example, there is more undergraduate women students in most Iranian universities than there are men. There are women who do engineering, many of them um, in, as postgraduates now in US, UK universities. There are many women who are doctors. So in many professions, despite the fact that initially the Iranian government was trying to keep women in the house as opposed to working outside, working outside is now completely accepted and it has been gained. It wasn't something that they offered, but it's been gained. Um, as you know, two weeks ago, Iranian women managed to get into a football match. They fought for it, but they now can do it. But I mean, in every step, they fought and they've got it. It's not that there aren't women, um, that there is a, a direct discrimination. The problem comes from either within the family or the practicalities of life in terms of women's uh, rights. And that's probably true of everywhere in the world, as well as Iran. Yeah. OK, on that quite optimistic, thank you very much for that amazing talk and so many examples. <laughs>